Thanks, Parmender. And I, I also want to echo thanks to the CHR and CLSA. And, and for folks who don't understand the breadth and depth of what's happening in the CLSA, I think that Parminder undersells it a little bit. It, it's when I talk to my colleagues around the world about what's happening here under Parminder's leadership and in collaboration with other folks around Canada, they're stunned, frankly, um, that this kind of large-scale project that's going to go on for decades and decades and decades is underway. And I think that um, kudos to Parminder and his colleagues for, for really taking the leadership role in making Canada the place where aging research is being advanced. So thanks to Parminder. And I also am really grateful to CIHR for, for taking the reins and in, in putting forward these, these cafes. I think they've done a wonderful job in terms of spreading the news about health research all across Canada. And uh, because we're being recorded, it can be spread across the world now as well, so people can see what's really happening um, in the latest and greatest in, in health research. What I really want to focus on, because I only have, I think, about 10 minutes, and um, it is, is just to sort of give you a flavor of some of the kinds of things that we've been thinking out about. And what I'm actually really looking forward to is the second half, which is where I get to hear, and my colleagues and I get to hear from you and hear what your questions are. Because when I've done these sorts of you know, cafes over the years in the past, we come here and we will have heard all kinds of questions from our colleagues who think about the same sorts of things we think about all the time and who read the same journals we read all the time. And so guess what? We have all the same questions. Uh, so when we come and we're able to talk and have, have these sorts of interactions with people who are thinking about things from a different perspective, it actually influences the way that we do our research. So that's my goal, is to make it through the next time, hear what my colleagues have to say, and then really get on to what you guys have to say. I think, as Parminder said, uh, the population is growing faster than ever. Uh, we have, you know, the first baby boomers just hit 65, and um, it, there used to be a thing called a population pyramid, which meant it was shaped like a pyramid because you had a lot of people who were little tiny babies at the bottom, and then as you went up through age, there were fewer and fewer people, so it was shaped like a pyramid. If I were to plot Canada's population pyramid right now, it actually looks like a population plus, because you've got this big swath of baby boomers who are moving through the system, and within the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's actually going to look like a population T. So it's really turning what we think about the demographics of our world on its head. And this is gonna have tremendous implications for every aspect of our lives, from the workplace to healthcare to transportation, communication, technology, and even our everyday social interactions. The changing demographics in Canada is changing the way that we live, and it's gonna to have to change the way that we interact with each other and, and think about things. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about some of the myths of aging and why it shouldn't really be a scary thing that we're turning from a population pyramid to a population T. Um, there are three very common myths about aging. One is that you're born and then it's all downhill from there. Sort of you're, there's a critical period, you develop some brain cells and connections, and then everything just kind of falls apart. Right? So that's one myth about aging. Another myth about aging is that as you get older, and this is related to the first myth, you can't teach an old brain new tricks. You can learn things when you're younger, but then if you don't learn it by a certain age, there's just no hope. That's another myth that we often hear. And a third myth we often hear is that as we age, everything just slows down. And that's a myth too. Those are all myths, and what I'd like to do is to take a few minutes and explain why none of those is actually really true given what we now know about aging and the brain. And I should say, if we were here 20 years ago, we would be having a very different conversation because the, the scientific study of aging and neuroscience is really, really new. So it was only in, in the late 90s, for example, that we first discovered that new brain cells could be born once you were an adult and even into older age. It used to be thought, as I said, you were a baby, you brought, got new brain cells, they could get connections, but then things just started dying. Your brain cells started dying or connections started failing. We now know there are new brain cells in this thing called neurogenesis that are born throughout our lifetimes. Exactly what those new brain cells are doing is still a little bit of a mystery. 
But the fact that we are able to regenerate brain cells, and, and even in some cases there's been some information suggestion that cells can change what type they are now. Um, there, there's the, the idea that you start off here and just fall apart is shifting. It, it suggests that we're much more plastic, um, which means that we can change. Okay. And then that leads me to this next point about the idea that older people can't learn or older, you can't teach an older brain new tricks. Uh, you know, there are some things that are certainly easier to learn when you're younger. I mean, so if you grow up immersed in a, in a second language, it's sure it's easier to pick it up. You don't have to think about it. But does that mean you can't learn a second language when you're older? Absolutely not. Um, my mother learned French in her 60s and she learned Hebrew in her 70s. Um, is she fluent? Does she have an accent? No, yes. Uh, but she can still learn things, um, and she's going for Italian, I think, next. So it, it, it's not the case that you can't learn things. And we have scientific evidence that shows that the brain can change as we age. So some of the work that we did uh, way back in the, I guess, late 90s, one of the first sort of studies that was looking at whole brain imaging in, um, in older people and younger people and looking to see how brain Beha brain behavior interactions worked. What we did was we basically just showed people a really simple task. We showed them a set of bars, and they could either be thin bars or fat bars. And we just said, tell us, are the bars thin or are they fat? When we looked to see how older people and younger people performed on this task, behaviorally, they were identical. You couldn't tell who was 65 or 75 and who was 25. They looked exactly the same. But when we looked at the patterns of brain activation across the entire brain, what we saw was that older people and younger people were getting to that performance level in very different ways. So it's a visual task. It's saying fat bars versus thin bars. And we know, we've known for a long time, that the part of the brain that's responsible for encoding vision is really right here in the back of your head, which is kind of nonsensical since it's as far as your eyes, from your eyes as you can get. But that's, this is the occipital cortex back here. So for basic visual information, it's the back of your head that's processing information in young people. When we looked at what was happening in the brains of young people, that part of the brain was really active and in fact it was correlated with the behavior. But when we looked in older people, it was active but it wasn't predicting the behavior. What was predicting the behavior were parts of the brain that in young people we tend to think of as being correlated with memory and attention. So in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So what, what it seemed to us that was happening, and there's more evidence that's come out since then that confirms this kind of hypothesis, is that the older brain was rewiring itself. It was changing the way that it was processing information. It was borrowing from one part of the brain to compensate for weaknesses in another. And you might say, well, why would you do that? Why would I steal from the hippocampus to pay the occipital cortex? Well, the answer, I think, is that Sensory information is just so fundamental to everything we do. If you can't hear something, and if you can't see something, there's nothing to remember, and there's nothing to attend to. So the priority for your brain has to be get the sensory information in there, and then if I can, I'll do something with it. So this is what we thought was happening. And the flip side of that is, if you think about some of the deficits that we sometimes think of for older people, what are some of the most common deficits that we hear? Yes, there are vision problems. Yes, there are uh, audition problems. Memory. It's hard to remember things. Attention. I can't divide my attention and multitask. Well, if you're borrowing from your memory system, you're borrowing from your, vi from your attention system just to see something, maybe there won't be as much of that resource left over to do the more complicated kind of tasks. So it's a kind of a trade-off. And that's one of the sorts of things that we've discovered is that as we age, the brain can change, it can rewire itself, but in doing so, you get these trade-offs. And that leads me to the last myth that I wanted to talk about, which is the myth of going slowly. It is true, as we get older, some things slow down. So your motor responses will slow, um, all sorts of other things will slow. And in fact, when you, when you go back to sort of the beginning of certainly vision research and aging, one of my very favorite quotes is from an older vision researcher who was sort of reflecting himself that when things are very simple, he can do it as well as, as ever. But if it becomes more complex, it's just he's slower at getting things done. And that seems to be true. But we have actually found one task where people are actually faster for older people. So they can actually, if you have a really big uh, grating, so a set of bars, and it's moving, 
back or forth. Older people tend to be able to see what direction it's moving faster than younger people. Um, so it's not the case that everything's slower. Some things are actually getting faster. And in this case, it's again a trade-off because we think that the reason that they're seeing it faster is because they're not inhibiting information the same way. So when you show that kind of a stimulus to younger people, they say, oh, it's just a background. I'm going to ignore it, so their brain inhibits it. For older people, if their inhibition system's not working as much, they don't turn it off so they can see the motion faster. So again, there's this kind of trade-off. We think that older people can maybe pick up the gist of things better, but it's harder for them to focus in on the fine details. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is that we can actually train them to do those sorts of tasks. Uh, so that, again, this is back on the learning. So just because you're in one state now and you're not able to necessarily multitask or something, uh, we've got Wheel of Fortune playing on the screen in the back. Um, if you practice that long enough, you're going to get better at it, whether you're 15 or 25 or 85. And so you can train yourself to improve. It just put, you have to take yourself out of your normal context, put yourself in different sorts of situations, and keep pushing your brain to its limit to make sure that you're compensating and, and using every part of your brain that you can. Thank you.